demanded to have you, mm -hmm. that he might sift you as wheat. But I've prayed for you, that your faith will not fail. It's good to know, is that the Lord's praying for you and me. Yeah. Yeah. He's praying that we're going to make it. Amen. That we're going to come through. He's praying that we're going to shake off the heaviness and the discouragement, the lethargy and the, the half-heartedness. He's praying that we're going to mean business. He's praying yes. that we're going to arrive at the other side knowing I've fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. I've finished my course. He's praying that we're going to make it. And of course, the gates of hell were and still are against the advance of the church. But Jesus said, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It's good to know who's in charge. Amen. Who's in control of all things. Our sovereign Lord. We just need to trust more fully his protection. And finally, to keep our spiritual fervor. Not just to know more clearly the purpose of God. Or to trust more fully the protection of God. To keep our spiritual fervor, we need to walk more confidently in the power of God. You see, if anything's going to be accomplished, it's not by your own might and it's not by your own power. It's by my Spirit, said the Lord. Yes. We need to be a people that are filled with the Holy Spirit. That covet the anointing. That every day we're crying out for God to, to fill us. That we're not doing things in our own strength and our own good ideas, but there is a sense of the hand of God, the breath of God, the power of God, equipping us to live for Him. It was C.H. Spurgeon who said, Without the Spirit of God, we can do nothing. We are ships without the wind, branches without sap, and like coals without fire. But with the Spirit of God. In Acts 1 verse 8, Jesus said, when the Spirit of God, that power comes upon you, you will receive dunamis, dynamite, power to be my witnesses. The same Spirit that was upon Jesus and the same Spirit that was on the disciples and upon the Apostle Paul is the same Holy Spirit. If the Spirit of Him who raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in you, it shall quicken your mortal bodies. How many of us need a quickening tonight? <laughs> and you know, it, it all comes from revelation. So important. I, I, I'm always saying that a person's life can be changed far more in one moment of revelation than 10, 20, 30 years of just listening to sermons. Do you know when the, the scriptures just leap off the page? That when, when things that we've known all our lives have been in the Bible, but now they're in our heart. The revelation has made them so much more meaningful. And the revelation I'm talking about is found in Ephesians 1. This tremendous verse, Ephesians 1, verse 18 and 19, where Paul again is praying, oh, that the eyes of their hearts might be enlightened and that they might know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power. In those who believe. The power of God in our lives. When we look at the Apostle Paul here. The reality of Christ's resurrection. Wasn't merely a doctrine. It was a dynamic power. As a result of encountering. The risen Christ on that Damascus road. His life was totally changed by the power of God. The one who hated the name of Jesus. Hated Christians. The one who thought it was his religious duty to wipe out Christianity. Now he says in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of my Lord Jesus Christ. Because it is the power of God to everyone that believes. You see, he wasn't ashamed because he knew the power had changed him. He'd seen the power through his ministry change the lives of others. He had a confidence in the power of God. And his heart cry in Philippians 3.10 is, Oh, that I might know him and know the power of his resurrection. There were few people that knew the power of God more than Paul. But the difference is this. Paul had an insatiable appetite to know more. 
he wasn't going to settle down for the form of godliness. He wasn't going to settle down just for religion. He wanted to know the power of God in his life. I believe what we need in the church today, up and down and throughout the land, is an awakening to that same power. In Isaiah 52 and verse 1, God says, Awake, awake, O Zion. Come clothe yourselves with strength. The strength is there in God, all that we need to live effectively for Him. But the first thing needs to be an awakening within us. In COVID, for two years, it seems as though the church has been anaesthetized. It just seems that the, the church has been asleep. But the giant of the church is being stirred, is being awakened, is starting to rise up upon its feet. God wants you and I to say, God, I need that awakening. God, I, 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 I need you to take me from that place where I've just settled for mediocrity. Now I want a real thing. Everything that I see in your word. What God can accomplish is amazing through spiritual people. Franklin Roosevelt, America's 32nd president, he once said, I doubt if there is a single problem, political or economic, that will not melt before the fire of a spiritual awakening. I believe that's so true. When God moves, when God just pours out His Spirit, extraordinary things happen. We need a revival again, don't we? It's been a long time since we experienced revival. I believe we're due for revival. 1904, my goodness, it is inconceivable that over a hundred thousand people could be converted and added to the churches of Wales in just a matter of seven months. Mm. Man could never accomplish that. But when God moves by the power of his spirit, just two or three years later, in 1906 and 1907, the power of God just sweeps across to America at a place called Azusa Street. A one-eyed black preacher is there in a shack of a warehouse, broken, tumble-down place. This one-eyed black preacher has gathered some together to pray for revival. And as the power of God falls upon Azusa Street, and the Azusa Street Revival begins. It sweeps not just across America, but across the world, changing the lives of countless thousands of people. Come clothe yourself with strength. The first thing is we need an awakening. The second thing is that we've got to come and ask God for that strength that he's promised in his word. In conclusion then, because you and I have been made in the image and likeness of God, our lives can never be ordinary and should never, ever be in any way insignificant. We've got a destiny because we're souls made up of divine substance. A destiny to fulfill. We can't be victorious in our own strength. Accomplish much in our own ability. But we can come and, in honesty, just face that question. Are you stumbling along, slipping back, or straining forward? And we're asking God to do what only He can do in our lives, in our church, in our, our ministry. It is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others. He'll do for you. Let's just bow our heads in prayer, shall we?